You're listening to the Waypoint TV Podcast Network, brought to you by Academy Sports and Outdoors. Hey everyone, this is Captain Steve Roger from Into the Blue TV. And as soon as I feel a little break from this heat, I know that hunting season's upon us. Actually, the first time I ever went hunting, a buddy took me. It wasn't my father or my grandfather. In fact, I took my father on his very first hunt. Well, Academy Sports and Outdoor Stores has everything to gear up for the field for less. Plus, you can shop a wide selection of ammo, shotguns, deer corn, rifle, feeder, game cameras, camo, and more from the brands you trust. Text HUNT24 to 22369 to take $20 off a $100 purchase when you shop hunting supplies at academy.com. Need a hunting license? Pick it up in store while you're shopping. George Clooney and Brad Pitt's new movie, Wolves, is on Apple TV Plus September 27th. That's where I want you to be now. So if you want to see George Clooney and Brad Pitt, go to Apple TV Plus. You got to start the story there. Or if you want to see Brad Pitt and George Clooney, go to Apple TV Plus. I am enjoying the show. And if you want to see their new movie, Wolves, you can't do it, I'm going to help you out. I can do it. So do it. Definitely go to Apple TV Plus. Admit it is cool. Okay, fine. It was very cool. Wolves, streaming September 27th on Apple TV Plus. Rated R. Hey everyone, this is Clint from the Western Hunting Up Podcast. Today I am joined with Mark, my podcast producer, and we are talking uh, my elk story and just all the lessons learned and things we have uh, discovered and, and uh, enjoyed so far this fall uh, on my Colorado over-the-counter uh, hunt, elk hunt, archery elk hunt. So uh, you guys have been um, out hunting, getting ready to hunt, uh, depending on what take you got. I got a buddy that sent me a picture of my buddy, Jason. Uh, hopefully by the time he listens to this, he has a mountain goat on the ground. He sent me a picture of a absolute stud today and I'm pretty excited for him. I can't wait to see pictures and, uh, that's going to be awesome. So all kinds of other guys are, um, putting stuff on the ground or getting out, uh, Dre shot a cow the other day and uh seeing all kinds of awesome things so pretty exciting for everyone out in the field and and shooting stuff or just going out and having a good time there's it's a lot of work uh mark and i are just discussing as he's driving through the night to get to colorado uh good for you mark it's a lot of work it's i think the biggest thing is it's a mental game but i think that our listeners want to pick up on where we left off that you're on day four. Yeah, the the day of. And and if you haven't listened to the previous episode, uh go listen to that first. It'll make a lot more sense. Uh but day four was was my almost last day, but pretty much the the action packed day. Day five was just a boring day. But uh day four was the action packed day where it all happened and uh pretty pretty outstanding day. Um, so let me ask you this, Clint, what was going through your head first thing in the morning when you woke up, what was your mental state? First legal elk, I'm shooting it. (laughs) Okay. So you, even though passed on other things passed on and, uh, legal, uh, day four, like I said, um, I'm not, I'm not like the guys on the, the gritty podcast, Brian, uh, whatever call it, Brian call. And, uh, Aaron Schneider being able to go out and spend 15 days. I'm sorry. I can't do it. Um, I am a family guy. Those guys are too, but I have young kids and I want to be home. Uh, so I I've had a lot of fun in the woods and I'm excited to get something on the ground and head home. And then there's still that looming little, what do I all have to do at home? Do I really want to get home Sunday and go to work the next day? And (laughs) <laughs> that would have been really hard. Uh, I don't even still, I've got, uh, tomorrow I had all day today. I had yesterday and I've got Sunday yet before I have to go back to work. And it was nice. Today was kind of crazy filling random orders, changing my oil, my truck, uh, finished the, um, processing on the back straps and the neck meat, uh, and the shanks 
Uh, I just have the quarters left to do, but those are hanging up in uh, in a cooler. That's awesome. Um, so one thing that I, I'm curious if you can touch on real quick is just give a recap on the experiences that you had over the last three days, the bowls, just a quick recap. So that way everybody's refreshed. Yeah. Uh, nonstop action within a few, four hours of my hunt. I missed a bowl, uh, had, uh, morning, evening, finding elk was not an issue. And I'm, I'm not going to lie. Uh, I know there's lots of guys out there that are struggling to even see an elk. Like I went for 10 days. I didn't see an elk. And, um, here I am complaining about wanting to go home and uh, I'm not, I was not complaining. (laughs) I, I, and I'm serious. I, I was walking around with a, don't forget this. This is, this is sucky. This hike sucks right now because you're sweating your butt off and it feels like the weather says it's 72, but it feels like it's 85, just 80 with that sun. Cause Colorado sun's pretty intense. And so I don't want to forget like, I and I'm selling myself this the entire time. Don't forget you're, you're enjoying the crap out of this. Look at this view. I stop and I take pictures here and there of this outstanding view, uh, pick pictures of all it. And, and I'm enjoying the crap out of it. Uh, and, and I know that I'm getting some action that a lot of guys are not there. I'm seeing elk. It's like crazy. And this is an over the counter unit. I just have put in a lot of time, uh, figuring out some different places and it's paid off. That's, that's all it is. Uh, and, and getting to, to learn a piece of ground. And for some reason, this area just had bulls in every other draw. And I, I don't even want to say that there was not bulls in every other draw. It's just, I, I'm, I was able to know that ground before I was even there through, uh, e-scouting and looking at some of those draws and saying that one is going to have elk, that one's going to have elk and that one's going to have elk. And I was pretty darn close. Uh, had a couple of surprises along the way, but they were vocal enough. And that was part of my, my plan was don't go opening weekend. Uh, but let's wait until that six when I am hiking in there. And my first full day is the seventh. Okay. Now those bulls should be active. It should be talking. And I'm hunting that eighth, ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th and having a, having a great time. So lots of action morning, evening, uh, passed on a bull and having a great time. So yeah, that's, that kind of was what, uh, sums up day, day one to three. Okay. So you, you've known which draws you've already hunted. You have a spike camp set up beyond your base camp, if that's correct. Now, take me through, are you going to be hunting the same draws because you know you've seen elk in there? You're going to try something new. What's your plan for today? Yeah, so I ditched that second spike camp and I went back to my my other camp and uh, um, just kind of refreshed, got some more, There, there's a nice spring there, got more water, uh, and I had a long hike to go back into where I had seen, um, seen some bulls in the in the previous days. Uh, my, my second camp was even further in there past that. So it it made sense. It was, it was an easy hike back to the, where I was planning to hunt. I'm walking in the bottom of these draws, uh, in the morning, it it made a lot of sense that wind was hit, was hitting those draws and going down. So, um, nice and easy to walk those bottoms of the draws. However, the elk were down in there sometimes. So I had to be a little careful. Uh, and, it just made controlling the scent pretty easy. So I'd walk down this long rancher's road and all the way back up um, another draw. And you've got these little finger draws all the way up this thing. And so you see one and you see another, see another, see the other, and you just keep walking up that. So early in the morning, I wake up and I just start walking. And I haven't gotten the chance to, to hunt with the moon that we did i I think the full moon is coming up here pretty quick something like that i believe so yeah and it's getting brighter and brighter but man it was dark over the last week or two uh dark 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 last week i should say and so i'm walking up this road now i'm pretty dark but i had about a four mile walk i want to say somewhere in there and 
mile about mile three in there. It's just getting to that that uh, light where you can start to see. And I'm walking this this old rancher's four wheeler trail at the bottom bottom of the straw, and uh, I look up and there's that familiar tan of the side of a elk, and he is at the bottom. Uh, and the bottom of these draws is just sage. Sage, you've got the, the ranchers always put their little trails along one side, and then you've got the bottom of the draw, which may or may not have water in it. This one did. And then uh, up on the other side, there's more sage and the bottom of the aspens and um, service berry pockets and whatever whatever cover there might be on that other side. So uh, walking, and all of a sudden I see that bull, and I was like, he's 100 yards away no joke, a hundred yards away. And it's just dark enough that he didn't see me. And he is walking, feeding, uh, by himself. And I pull my binoculars up. Holy crap. That's a nice six point bull. Holy crap. He's a, that's a really nice six point bull. He has. And one thing I learned from Jay Scott is pay attention to the fists. If the fists match the force, that's a great bull. Uh, so, his fists didn't quite match, but they were, they were good size and I could just see good beam length. I'm not judging a bull in the, in the looking for a three thirty bull versus a three hundred inch bull. I don't care. A six point bull was kind of my goal in the whole thing anyway. So looking for a six point, there's a six point and he's a stud. So, he doesn't see me. I take a couple more steps down the road and his head is probably, it's tough to tell because it's dark, uh, but it's, but his head is somewhat behind a, just a few little aspen trees, uh, cut, giving me just enough cover. I walk up and I see a little opening in the sage, uh, just, and I'm not talking an opening. I'm talking about little slips and cracks in the, in the, in the sage where the coyotes are kind of running through. So I find a little, gap and I zigzag my way through the sage and I get to the bottom of the draw where I can get just a touch of cover. And then I go to the other side of the, of the Creek bed, the kind of like, I guess we'd call it almost a high water mark. Uh, and that ended up being probably 30 yards from where I was, um, not 20 yards. Cause when I ranged him right there as he's feeding and he's walking across, uh, that ended up being like 80 I arranged him at like 90 and then I arranged him at like 82 yards and it's just dark enough. There was something in my head that said, do not take that shot. Like that shot was off the table for some reason. And I don't know why it just was off the table. I told myself, you have not shot your broadheads at 82 yards. Um, and it's just a little too dark, but I kick myself later for not taking that shot. That is a shot I can take all day long and I can make that shot, especially on a giant elk and my right. brothers are flying good. Um, I had the time I ranged it. I could have dialed my sight into 82, put it on him, smoke him. I know I could have, but he walks up there and I, and I, the thing I was telling myself then was, I know I can get closer to this bull. I just got to get in some cover. So I let him get in some cover and then I kind of hightailed it up there a little bit to get into the cover with him and just be behind him. The wind is still going down into the bottom of the draw. So wind's not a problem. We got more of a crosswind. So I don't want to go too high into the cover because then he's going to come back down underneath me and catch my wind. The other things I haven't talked about in the last episode and this one is what calls I'm making, uh, maybe a little bit, but, uh, I listened to one of the previous Remy Warren podcasts and he talks, he was, was talking to um, Corey Jacobson and uh, Remy was saying how he, he, he doesn't even know what he's doing for his calls. And I feel like everything that I've done through practice and experience with elk, plus what I've been using and learning from some of these experts, I, it just came together and I knew what I needed to do do and say um i didn't think about it too much and i think that came through some of the practice and some of my my mental 
game plan of do this, do this, do this. And then just when I get in the moment, it just comes automatic. It's really interesting and kind of confusing how that happens where you, I, I would think, cause I'm not elk hunting for 30 days every year. I'm not doing that. I'm doing it for four or under really is what it's been uh, for the last few. And then um, 2000, 2020, that was a day, a year I spent a good 10, eight days hunting somewhere in there. Uh, and then before that, I was able to do that because I was a Colorado resident. So anyway, this bull's slowly meandering off. He doesn't know I'm there yet. I I was sneaky enough, got up into the trees, and he is just out of sight. And I know that he's going to be able to, to hear me and look back and expect that animal to be right there. I mean, that's the yeah. biggest thing we talked about is the hangups. Um, I know what I got to do. I got to turn my head the one way, cow call, and get up a few feet as far as I can get. So I do that. I cow call and I'm kind of in the open. I get as far in as I can into the cover, and I caught his interest. He bugled right away at me. Uh, I can't remember if I bugled. I did I can't help it. I got a bugle, <laughs> even though, <laughs> even though this is a traveling bull, he is easy to call in and he wants a cow. Uh, but I know he was also a big bull. So if there was a cow right there to be rounded up, uh, that's what those big bulls are doing. All these five points that I've been seeing were feeling like studs. They all had cows. These five points were like, I'm, I'm a stud. I'm a stud. I got these cows. I wrangled them all up. I'm, I'm tough as nails. Nobody can touch me. And then now what's happening as we get into the, into the double digits of September is those bigger bulls are now going to head into those herds and see, Hey, little man, thanks for rounding these ladies up, but time to go. Uh, I got it from here. Yep. I got it from here. They, they don't have to do all that work and they've been, they know the game. They don't need to get riled up and waste all that energy ahead ahead of time so that's what he was probably doing or he got kicked out from another bill who knows uh that could have happened and the story continues so um i get up there i get his attention and we he kind of comes and then he backs off and and he's he's being really hesitant to come back because he's like i was just there there's no there's no cows there who's coming up behind me and, uh, I, I snuck in and we kept, this probably only went for about 150 yards, uh, before he was crossing a little opening and over a ridge and I got him to come back and he came to 45 yards and all I could see was his neck and head. And he looked just like my podcast cover. I'm not oh, kidding. Man. Just, he wasn't quite that big cause that's a big bull, but just that dark mean looking, I'm looking through you look uh just looked cool he looked really cool um just a beautiful six point bull and he uh was looking and looking and i did what i could there um he knew there was nothing gonna be there he couldn't see see anything i needed him to take another five steps or so. And I think I could have made it happen. Uh, I was trying to, trying to get lucky with that, but I did what I could. And he barked after a bit cause he couldn't see anything and off he went. And every bull that barked at me, um, there was a couple that did, I barked right back. And cause that was one of the things I had heard from, from some of these good callers as they say, bark right back and add a little chuckle back to it. So what they're doing is barking at you to say, Hey, where are you? And so I'm barking back. Um, yeah. Or the, what are you? Yeah. Didn't work, but it may have had, I had my decoy right there that I, I had a really hard time with the decoy. This, this trip compared to the last one I had where I had it at the wrong time or I didn't have it when I needed it. So kind of a bummer, but 45 yards and off he went. I chased him down thinking like, okay, he got into the trees and I hustled over to that draw. Uh, he was still bugling every once in a while. He wasn't too, too butthurt about the whole situation. So, uh, 
I went up and I was like, ha, this, this is not happening. I just backed off. So there I am. That is the lowest of the low of the trip of just kicking myself thinking that was my opportunity at my best bull, just a stud mature six point really kicking myself 82 yards. I should have done it. I walked down to the draw, took that arrow, uh, that I missed the bull with, uh, two days earlier. I knocked it ranged 82 yards on a dirt, but a little white rock on a dirt patch. And I shot and hit three inches above that. Thank you. I can hit 82 yards. (laughs) No problem. Uh, and it's like, okay, I got to just do it just because, and sure enough. Yeah, I can, I can shoot that, but so kind of kicking myself for that whole scenario and uh, continued down. It's like, all right, told myself back to plan a, what I was doing. Uh, I was supposed to go down to this far draw where I had, I had passed on that little bull and I was going to go shoot that five point bull that probably was still in there. So off I go, uh, got to hike up another five, six draws or so. And, and that took, I don't know, half hour. And so it's probably at this time, 845, I get to the bottom of that draw. And I know there's this little 20 yard clearing in the middle of it. And not clear, clear. There's still aspens kind of scattered throughout, but enough to get some good, uh, good shooting lanes in it so because i had passed on that bull in there so i said all right that's kind of my central point i want to get to that little meadow and i bet you there's a bull in there somewhere because i didn't really disturb him too bad the night before uh and i walked up to just the bottom of the base and i was like all right i need to see where these bulls are at are they going to be on this side or this side of the draw uh one is a little thicker than the other uh, but that draw and the fo- next one are kind of connected. It's got some cover there that, that, uh, on the North side that those bulls could easily jump from that one to the next, this one that I'm in. So all I do is let out one little locator bugle. And again, I was close enough, probably within, oh, actually I do know that would have been about 400 yards or so, uh, and maybe 500 and I hear my reply. Perfect. Right up there. He's on the left side. I'm going to walk up and the wind's going to be coming down for quite a few, quite a while now. And as the sun hits it, it's going to be traveling up the other side. So it's not going straight at him. I got some time to just sit this bull out and I'm going to sit in that little meadow until these, these bulls kind of mingle around. Uh, finally want to maybe bed and the cows want to come check or the cow's bed. And then maybe he wants to come down and check me out. So that was my game plan. Roughly what time was this at, Clint? So 8.45, I think I let that that bugle out. Okay. And um, let's see. I actually am really kind of curious about that to see if I've got that time down even more correctly. Because I can look. Oh, 912. I started my camera. Okay. So let's just say 845, 9 o'clock. Could have been 9 o'clock because this happened pretty quickly. I'm going to say 9 just for the heck of it. And I got that bull located. Scoot in. And I just get to that little clearing. He is bugling a little bit. Just let me know where he is roughly. And I take my decoy out. It's like, okay. I'm going to sit on the edge of this. It's a little clearing. He's going to need to see something. I take that, that, and I, and I wire it to a tree that is going to be change his direction and give, he's going to be looking down and across instead of across at me. So hopefully that'll direct his eyesight and his movement. And he'll be walking right towards that, giving me a broadside shot. So that was my thought process. I'm not sure that it mattered though. Um, although, I, I wouldn't change anything that I did. It was a little piece of insurance. I don't even think he saw it. So I, I'm not positive. So then I get to that little clearing. Again, in my head, I'm thinking, 
this guy's bugling. I can't wait to show Ty this video or I want him to see this or hear this video uh, or the audio. So I take my phone and I set it up. I just prop it real quick and it's facing me and I hit record. That's 912 is when I hit that. Uh, hit record and an eight minute and 22 minute, eight minute and 22 second video is what I shot for this to all to happen. I sit there and I start calling just some basic little muse and add in a couple of little tending bugles, some bull calling cows bugles, and he's coming. I start ranging like crazy. I'm ranging this, ranging that, deciding where he's going to be coming down and thinking, okay, this is like 55 yards, 60 yards is probably where I'm going to first see him. Shot could be like 55 and I'm just ranging like crazy. Uh, okay, my site is 20, 30, 40, 50, and my 50 is my slider. So anything past 50, I got to move my slider. And I want to be exact. I got 500 grain arrows. I don't have room for gap in that. I want to, I just want to put it on it and go. So um, Colin, and he's coming. I hear the antlers coming through the trees. And this is at that point, it's like that is not a five point. I hear those antlers. They are not the five point that, or the little four point that was in there the night before. Thick. There's something about the sound of it. Um, if you take a, a big old three inch branch, three inch in diameter branch and rake a tree, it sounds different than you take a little one inch twig. That's what it sounded like. It sounded big and dense and thick, hitting the branches coming through and the cows are mewing up there. And I don't know what he's doing exactly coming, not coming whatever else, but he started, started coming and he eventually poked his head out there and just started walking. And I can see that right on the screen. He's walking right across. Uh, and, and he's, a, he's, even as I'm telling this, might as well have, have the audio up on my phone and going so I can talk my way through it. Oh, there he is. Okay. Right at one minute. Holy smokes. It took me one minute for him to come. And that whole time, no, I did not. I did not uh, bugle. See, this is value of recording this because I had, again, what did I do? <laughs> I don't remember. Uh, so <laughs> um, I'm ranging him right at one minute into it, and he's walking right across. And then I see antlers that are, are curling up. And they're oh, like going out and curling. It's like, this is a different bull. Then the last one, the last one was a good bull. This is a bull. He has curl to him. He is dark and white tips. Just oh, gorgeous bull. And he's walking across and he stops. And there is a gap. I'm looking at the gap on my phone right now. And I can see one tree cuts down. Uh, right through his front legs as he stops and the other tree is going right through his guts so there is a perfect gap there right where an arrow needs to go and I pick up my range finder again and now I can't settle that thing down I can't settle my range finder on the elk <laughs> I can barely see that it is an elk all I see is tan and my hand is shaking and shaking and shaking <laughs> like crazy. And on the video, I, I like clamp down my elbow as hard as I can. And I'm leaning against my bow. It's like, just range it, range it. It's like like on Liar Liar when he's telling it with the blue pen and the red pen. It's like <laughs> that was the situation. I could not get it to do what I wanted it to do. Driving me absolutely insane. Side story. Later on, hanging out at Glenwood Springs Outdoors in Glenwood. Fun little uh, outdoor shops if you need stuff. Stop in there. Uh, Manager Danny is my buddy. Uh, he pulled out the Sig Sauer uh, image table yeah. binoculars and said, hey, t step outside and look at the hillside in this. We went outside, looked up at the uh, Glenwood Caverns. I'm like, yep, look like normal binos. Flip it on. Oh my gosh, you can just see everything. It's like you're on tripod right now, just scrolling. This is outstanding technology. So 
I haven't done it yet because I haven't spent too much time researching, but my next rangefinder is an image stabilizing rangefinder because my sight picture through my peep and my pin is not like that. Like there's something with my draw that is stable and I'm relaxed and I'm able to hold steady. I've got a little blackout on a couple of things that I ha- I'm not paying attention to because it, which is fine. It, all that anchor and this and that, and the feel of like my, my beard on my fingers is I, I don't pay attention. I don't think about it, but um, everything else in automatic, but the ranging, it is out of control, like buck fever, like no other. And I, I know I get that sometimes even on stinking does when I'm not the shooter. So I just uncontrollable and he stands there for a minute. And as I'm, I'm watching this video, just trying to range and I, I put, take my hand down. I change, I pick up my bow. I'm about to draw. Nope. Pick up my range finder again. Uh, clamp my elbow down range and range and range. And it's like 60, 55. Nope. I go and I go to full draw. I nope let down adjust my head second thoughts on my, <laughs> my dial go and i adjust it and then i grab my oh there he goes that's me calling right there okay i'll leave it just a little behind a, away from the mic but um adjust that and right as i draw again he, he walks away and so he bugles can you hear that Um, so he bugles and he's walking away. I was like, I just screwed this up. I just screwed this up. So I let out a little bit of a nervous bugle and a bit of a challenging few mews. Get him excited again. He bugles back. I let, an, I let out a bugle with some chuckles. I'm listening to do it and getting excited. So that's what this is what I did right now. You're telling ask me what I needed to get woken up to do this podcast. And here it is. So we're in a we're in a bugling battle. Bugling back and forth. He's getting excited. And I can't see what the bull's doing right now because I'm in the way in the video, but I know he was just kind of back there and he goes to, yep, there he goes. He goes to a tree. And so we're three minutes into this video now, three minutes, 15 seconds, and he goes to a tree and he starts raking it like crazy. Oh boy. He's about 65 yards away and something in my head says, get closer. So I get up. I'm still in the frame of the old iPhone. And I have no interest in filming my stuff, but this is kind of cool. And he's just raking the tree. And I put one a- couple aspens right in between me and him. And he just keeps raking and raking. And there I get up to uh, as close as I think I want to safely. And I take old shaky arm, range again, and again and again and again, just to confirm. <laughs> and I got 55. So approximately where he's at. He's I can see his whole body, but he's quartering to me hard. And, and I was like, this is a bad shot. Not on an elk. No way. That's going to go point of the shoulder, which is a horrible idea. If I'm a little to the right, it's going guts. Uh, Left, I hit. It's not a good idea. Small little pocket. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. So um, we're into... Five minutes, five minutes, 20 seconds. I'm still standing there. I'm ranging, changing things. Is he still raking? Still raking. Six minutes. Holy smokes. I never timed this out before. It's over three minutes of him raking. There it is. Three minutes almost exactly he rakes that tree. I have my dial set at 55. He steps to the side, and I draw, shoot, and that arrow soars up there and sticks him perfect left and right but just a little high uh and right where that shoulder blade is is starting but it's not that thick and i could see my arrow did not bury itself but it went in there and i knew it was a good shot still 
he ran about 20 yards to the right to the to the trail that went back up into the trees that it came in on uh and i could just see him standing there he's quartering away uphill very hard uh and i just see tan body so i sneak over five yards to the right i got a clearing there range it at 62 yards and dial my sight draw again and send that arrow and it buries it disappears in him so that oh. arrow, that arrow actually went up through the guts and just into the money and he ran okay. off so from there I, I i can see i got my bow on my head with a oh my gosh oh my gosh oh my gosh oh my gosh i just did that i just did that went back to my stuff my my stuff right there i'm i called a little bit uh, ran back to my bugle bugled quick there's one real quick with one bugle there's a bugle that sounded good uh, versus the other nervous bugles and i'm trying to listen all that get a little closer but i didn't want to get too close I look at the camera and I just shot a bigger one. <laughs> I yelled, I just shot a bigger one. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> With my eyes popping out of my head. Uh shut that off and just put it put it away. So that was nine uh nine twelve. The vid start of that and the whole thing took eight minutes and twenty two seconds. I set that down and I had a lot of praying in there, had a lot of Holy crap, holy crap, holy crap. Stop and looking up at the 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 aspen trees, the the canopy there, just having a moment of that just happened. That just <laughs> happened. The sun is peeking through. It is quiet in there. I still hear the mewing up on the hill. And there is uh I, I think I hear some crashing. I think I hear some noise and stuff. Uh, I, I'm not sure. I mean, there's elk up there, so it's kind of hard to tell. Um, but I said, it's 912 right now, basically 915 when I made this plan. 915, I was like, I'm not moving till 1015. That was stinking hard. Uh, normally, I was like, oh, I just want to run up to that tree and see if there's blood. I want to see if there's my arrow, anything like that. I said, no, do not leave this spot until 1015. Uh, normally I would have made some coffee. I had left my jet boil back at my camp. Uh, I like, I need to eat something. I was like, I don't really want to eat anything. I just don't feel like it. Uh, had a forced a couple of snacks down, uh, drank some water. And then I tried to just zone out and I went to my phone and my pictures and continued on. I was on January, 2024 and deleting pictures. <laughs> so <laughs> I, this is like, I got to do something. I got to just get in a different headspace and forget where I'm at for just a minute. Cause I got to not go anywhere. Got through 2024, got caught up on my pictures with all my, thousands deleted and watching my kids and having a having a good time with watching all that uh and finally it hit 10 15 um i take that back there was a couple other things i did in there instantly i tech i sent in this message to uh my wife my dad and then a buddy or two and um the outfitter so the outfitter in the area that i had the pack out plan with uh, let them know. Bull down. Uh, bull took two good arrows. Not confirmed yet. Uh, need to get in there and, and see uh, if I got him down. Uh, I will let you know. And that's all, all I had for that hour. And I'm pretty sure I had a bull down. So next step, walked up to that tree to see what was there uh found the tree that he was raking and it was kind of an odd spot i mean it's like he had completely ignored the deadfall that was laying there and he just found the nearest tree that looked right uh apparently he just walked right over that deadfall which makes perfect sense i guess if you're an elk uh and he 
had been raking that tree. I looked over, no arrow, no blood, no nothing. Uh, and I know the direction he was at. I had taken a picture from down below on where he was going out. And there is a couple of logs. And you can see that in the picture, how those those logs right there are going across and one's going yep. down an angle. So I was yeah. like, okay, I'm going to... I know he was just to the left of that one log that's at an angle there and say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to find that log and that'll be my, my point of reference right in there. Finally found just a little bit of blood and it was an hour later and the sun was on it. So it started to dry and that was a little trickier than that fresh blood, but I started to find a little bit, not a lot. Uh, and just took it slow, slow. And that's, Kind of what I do with people is I teach in my, at work, I teach them how to follow a blood trail and I'm telling them all these things that you need to do. It's like, all right, I haven't done this in a while because I haven't had a blood trail it just for the sake of, you can't control it. Every time you shoot something, you don't have to blood trail. Uh, but I haven't really blood trailed something that difficult lately. And this one was a hard one. There wasn't a ton of blood, uh, he didn't, he didn't end up going that far, but found a little bit of blood and was on the trail. Did you have tracks that you could go off of at all? Or what was the train like? A little bit. Uh, I was looking for that, but there was, there was a lot of elk sign in the area. So it was a little tricky. I could see where okay. there's some of that disturbance and he didn't hit that trail uh, right away. So there wasn't like a nice, perfect um, setup there for for seeing those tracks uh i sure. i think i could have done a little bit better at looking for those tracks though that's for sure and so i just i knew his direction because right where he disappeared and i sent that second arrow was a really well established trail so i kind of jumped ahead the five ten yards and got to there and many many elk i've or elk and deer that i've shot there hasn't always been a lot of blood in the first 10 yards i just yeah. don't see it sometimes you just don't get that that blood uh, especially on a high shoulder shot, I figured he wasn't going to bleed a lot. And what we learned in the last podcast with our blood tracking dogs, elk clot like crazy. Uh, yep. So, all right, learn that, that those things are going to clot pretty quick. And in a spot there that that, that blood is not easily just pumping out. Uh, I had no idea about the second shot. I didn't know it was as far back as it was. So I thought that one's got to be bleeding. Um, found some blood and thought, oh man, this blood's up high. And that's always a, always a thing I look for. And it's on both sides. It's like, okay, that's good. I didn't have a, uh, I didn't shoot through the thing, but I've got two arrows in it. Um, was seeing, there was a couple spots of really good blood. I saw bubbles. I was like, yes, that was a moment of this bull is dead, but I got to yeah. find him still. This is thick cover all over in here. And I was already imagining I'm going to be grid searching this thing here pretty quick. And probably uh oh to my first picture um dang uh my first picture of him is at 10 40 wow i took a half like 25 minutes before i found him and maybe dang i'll just say 20 minutes so i took my time on that he only went 60 yards but I took 20 minutes to cover, to cover 60 yards and just crept and crept. And then I lost the blood. Uh, I guess he had, and it's just like you, when you're following a blood trail, you're, you've got a direction that you're going to go and you, and, and he could have gone either one. And I went down the wrong one. Uh, but I just kept going down it for a minute, knowing I'll just come back to that little fork and, and then I'll go back up. And then I look up to my left and there he is splayed out laying on that log with a, oh, I found him just a flood of relief of, I found him. And I was yeah. only doing that for 20 minutes, just like, holy crap, there he is. And I could see that curl. I could see the dark horn, the white tip, and he's laying on a log all splayed out, just dead as can be. Um, just an exciting, exciting moment. And I don't know if you can hear this, but this is my audio right when I walked up to him. Can't believe what I just did. Look at that. Look at this freaking monster. That is everything. 
He would want in the bowl. Holy crap. Oh my gosh, I'm freaking out. Yeah. Came in clear as day. <laughs> Perfect. Oh man. Yeah. I, I I feel the excitement in your voice. Did you have any doubts when you you know when the blood started drying up and you didn't see anything? What was going through your head there? Oh, for sure. I I knew I in this kind of country, they've got pockets there. And for a bull to leave that pocket, he he wouldn't have been able to he wouldn't have been hit that hard. I knew he was hit hard and he had two arrows in him. Two yeah. solid arrows. And I had guessed uh and I, I was roughly right. There was about 13 inches, 12, 13 inches of penetration of that arrow blowing through the shoulder blade and into what would be double lung, a uh, high double lung. Um, and in the back, the second arrow went up through the guts and that just disappeared into that stuff. Uh, I haven't broke down the shoulder blade yet, the front shoulders to see any of that stuff, to see what it looked like. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that arrow, the second one just went up through it and just died in the right there in the in the lungs and it maybe it hit like a some of the stuff in the t- front of the neck there and and uh kind of stopped but the one i found both broadheads and i found like three pieces of arrow uh had trouble figuring out which arrows were which and uh <laughs> what was what piece went where and when that all happened um the 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 first one i did confirm that that had a good 12 inches of penetration because it broke off right at the skin level and was stuck down in there. And I yanked that thing out. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to kind of look at the opposite shoulder blade and see if there was some damage to it. Uh, if, if that's where it had stopped, but it, uh, that was, that was as much penetration as you could have asked for. Uh, it, it definitely went and, Maybe I'm off on my 12 inches there, but it broke through the shoulder blade and probably went up into the other shoulder blade. So good to go there. And the other one was just buried in the nasty stuff. But from there, it was it was a challenge. Like I've broken down bulls before, but on a I've never shot a big mature bull. And they're heavier. <laughs> they are heavy. And I have yeah. back problems. Uh, I have herniated discs that when I do all kinds of lifting, and somehow maybe just through my pill reg- regimen that I have had planned on this trip, um, I, I take my vitamins and my omega-3s and this and that and the leave, uh, and I go to sleep every night with a Tylenol PM. Uh, it just loaded up with that. I had a prescription for... Um, just some back pain just for that. It's just a little steroid that when I have some back pain that, uh, take that and you can, it helps just heal things up real quick. So I took, I brought those and I was like, just in case I'm going to, I'm going to be rough on my back. I, I was taking those and I battled through that whole processing and I'm so glad my back was feeling good. Uh, but I was reminded like, this is a young man's game. I'm only 37, but it's like do that whole process or uh, quartering out process. I just thought, I don't know how much longer I could even do this. There's no way if I had to pack this thing out the eight miles to get to my truck, it's like, there's no way there's no possible way I could physically do it. And no possible way that uh, I could do it in time. That the meat was going to be good. Um, I of course had buddies say, I'll come get you. I'll come get you. I'll come help. I'll come help. It's like, no, 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 it's okay. I paid the outfitter. I just have to get it a little ways. No big deal. I got it. Uh, which I'm not going to downplay that as softening up this hunt. That was part of it. I went through a lot of phone calls and a lot of figuring out the regulations on this and where, who I could use to do that. That was part of the hunt is finding that outfitter and being okay with paying a, a trespass fee, fee to or a fee to have have him pack that out. Uh so I've got no shame in that at all. This is a this is an over the counter unit still. And it's just because it's a little ways back there, 
that I think that I, I was fortunate enough to find these pockets of elk when there was a lot of them. Uh, but man, him laying against that log with this, with his leg underneath tucked, that was hard. And I tried to do my best to take some pictures. I took a pile of them and they always come out as best as you can with a timer. You hit it, you got to run uphill and then, uh, uh, get there quick. And it's a challenge. Can I give you a secret? Yeah. So the best pictures that I've ever gotten, you know, with doing that whole timer thing, forget the timer, take a video, set it up, prop it up, take a video, go back and screenshot where you want it. That way you're getting oh, as many yeah. pictures all the way along. You don't have to keep running back and forth. Yeah. I found that. Oh works yeah. Really well. Is that, um, the quality the same? Yep. Oh. Yep. I get the same quality as I do on a picture. I'll do that on the next 317 inch bull I shoot. Yeah. Oh, I know you will. <laughs> so for broadheads, you were shooting iron wheel, were you not? I sure was. Yes. Fixed uh, blade or mechanical? The the they only have the the fixed blade. Oh, that's right. Sorry. I'm, no, I'm sorry. I was saying that's Grim, Grim Reaper. Reaper about that. Yep. yep. The yep. the fixed blade, uh the Schneider core system uh that is got the bleeders on it it's the solid broadhead not the vented one the wide uh and glue in i am sold on glue in broadheads because when you mess one up you just gotta heat it up pull it out and with the field points i was doing the same thing it's really really nice uh there was a little bit of damage to those broadheads they look a little serrated now um, they hit some bone. Uh, so I've got some mad sharpening to do on those. There's, they've, uh, they got a little serrated, which was kind of crazy. Cause I've seen those things put to the test and they hit a lot of hard stuff with it, but this, it also hit a hard thing <laughs> and, and right. jostled around in there. So yeah, I, I was sweating after that, but cutting that thing up, I have a, a picture of, um, wrapping the hoof around with my rope and r- run it up to a tree and then back to the antler, uh, just trying to get that hind quarter cut all the way around. And it was, it was something else. So quite a hunt. Did you, did you do the gutless method on that? Yeah. Yep. And, okay. and I always do that. Uh, there's no, the only reason I open up that, uh, stomach cavity area is, when I need to relieve a little bit of pressure to get to the tenderloins or get into something, um, it, it's kind of, especially with his, his butt down facing downhill. Uh, I was trying to get the tenderloins in there. So just opening up that stomach cavity a little bit, not the stomach itself, but the, the abdominal cavity and allowing some of that stuff to go downhill, just relieve some of the pressure. And then I was, could get those tenderloins out and all these, bull elk holy smokes those tenderloins are huge uh normally i put one full tenderloin out of a deer into a package i just process those today i cut them in half and there's two my two meals there's four meals there for tenderloins there's, oh, man. there's a lot of there's a lot of meat there and the back straps holy smokes those things are big they were big and in the process i took all the neck meat as well uh, that I'm going to be able to just grind all that. And, and I do a lot of, I have no shame in, in grinding a lot of meat. Cause I eat a lot of, a lot of ground stuff. Uh, but there's going to be a lot of burger in there and, and sausage and whatever else. So eventually got them broken down and I was on a time limit. I started finally, the outfitter got back to me and, and, uh, we made game plan of where to get the meat. And I was like, I, I need two more hours. And it took a total of three hours and, and 15 minutes to break this whole bowl down and to pack it to where I needed to go. Uh, and so I, I had told him about halfway through, I need two more hours. I'll have this broken down and I'll have it to our, our meeting point. And, uh, um, right as I'm on almost the last quarter of packing it down, he said, how about noon tomorrow? I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> noon, oh no. Noon tomorrow. 
I'm ready. Oh, no. <laughs> so oh. I say, yep, no problem. So from there, it was, I, I didn't really hang the meat. I hung it up just to get air circulation. And I was concerned about that. So a couple of lessons learned, um, or lessons to share. I, I've, I've quartered a lot of deer and antelope. And I would say if, if you're coming West to do one of these things, you better be quartering a lot of deer and antelope to practice. You really, really need to, to know where those bones should be and then just blow it up a little bit. If I haven't done as much processing as I have in the past, uh, in the last two years, I've processed probably a hundred deer through my, my program I do for work. So I get to see a lot of that bone structure. I get really comfortable with it. And this was still really challenging because I don't do an elk every year or I've done it like every other year. Um, or close to every year, it, it's just not enough. When you get as many deer as you get down, you can, you can really practice that and get that experience. Um, secondly, I had three large game bags, the elk size one, I should have had four. I had three large ones and two smaller ones. Um, because of that wait time I had to put, I was concerned about the heat that was generated. I had the two front shoulders, in one game bag and a hind in another and a hind in a, in a different one. And then I had the back strap tendering and, and neck meat in one of the other bags. And then, and the last bag, I had that same tendaloin back strap neck meat. So pretty well spread out, but there was some big masses of meat there that needed to get cooled down. So what I did, got it to that point, found a, found a bunch of trees, nice, as cool as it's going to be. It's in that that 72 degree area, uh, really comfortable out, very nice out. But when you're looking at meat, you're like, let's go cooler. Let's get colder and yep. uh, let that air circulate. I constantly was kind of flipping and moving. And I didn't, before I got everything hooked up, when I was bringing stuff down and, and dropping it, I would, I would kind of come back and flip it, flip it just keep that, that air circulation going. Then you started feeling the meat. You're like, Oh, this is cooling down. It's got that evaporative cooling effect going and getting pretty cool. Uh, so I started breaking off little branches and, and, uh, don't think you can hoist those in a tree too well. Uh, I told you it was going through your pack the other day as you were loading paracord up. I really wouldn't want to leave that meat very long, uh, in lots of, in bear country with lots of bears. And you may have to find a way to hoist that up somehow uh bears can climb trees so you can't just hoist it up along the trunk um but i just hoisted it up just so it was off the ground got good circulation from there i decided which i was also running out of water again for some reason i was drinking a lot of water in this trip and it was hot out um when i was hiking a lot i needed to go back to my camp and i'm gonna bring my small little tarp back and I'm going to sleep with that meat. That was my game plan. I'm going to sleep right there with it. Somebody wants to come and some bear wants to come and drag this off. They go drag my head off my, any of that stuff. <laughs> They're going to meet my little 380. That's all I carried, uh, <laughs> which that's all I carry. Cause I'll, I want it to be light, but also I'm not concerned about bears and lions in the, in the woods. It's more like creepy methods. Uh, so have my little 380 and I hung out there for the night. And the next morning I realized I was super tired. Uh, day of was like 15 and a half miles. So it was a long day for me. I don't typically do anything longer than that, but that was a, that was a long, long day of hiking. My feet were shot. And, uh, so the next morning, the, uh, biscuits and gravy peak is one of the most heavy meals I think you can have. I didn't finish okay. it, but perfect meal for sitting around camp for and not going anywhere. Uh, and just filling your stuff, so your stomach full of something. And I drank and drank water. And, uh, um, I, uh, cause I had the outfitter bring me in. I had a, had a beer there. It was wonderful. Um, and just had, just tried to fill up. And went to bed before dark, 
woke up, got startled somewhere like, I don't know, 10 ish at night because the elk was barking. So those elk were still there. An elk barked at me, and there was, I woke up two or three other times with elk bugling. Uh, and it was awesome. Yeah. The, it, that woke up finally and got a, got a, in reach message from the outfitter saying he'd be there about 11, 1130 or so. And he comes rolling up and, and loaded it, got it off the mountain and off. I went back to town. So pretty, pretty awesome. Awesome hunt. Couldn't ask for anything better. Well, you definitely got a hunt of your lifetime there. You got the big bull that you were wanting. Well, I held out. So let me, uh, quiz you here about the water that you were hunting was there any other water really around i know that you were mentioning that, that you had hard times finding spots to fill up do you think that that was a big draw area for the elk yeah and the bottom of these draws are typically just where the where the water is or it runs down some of those draws and the water can be dirty because there's cattle around and they stomp all over that stuff and it's it's like I don't know if I want to drink that. So you gotta go find the actual spring. Um, there's a couple of spots in there right by my main camp that that water had been those cows were all over in it, but then I kind of go a long ways down where it's kind of filtering through the grass and and uh some other things, running over a lot of stuff. And I filtered that water. Uh I will say that catadine gravity bag it was awesome yep. it's like that water comes out of there so fast it's just like a the the water out of a fridge which is sometimes a little slow for when you're in your kitchen but when you're in the back country that is that is fast it is really really fast and then i was able to scoop up that water or out of the little, I found the little springs coming out of those, the rocks. And I just sucked that right up in there. It was the one time that I was so dehydrated. I just drank it straight from that little spring coming out of the rock and a foot away is a cow track. Uh, really nervous about that, but I'm not sick. So I was so dehydrated. <laughs> I don't care. I'm sticking my water bottle down in there, chugging a little bit back down in there, chugging some more. Uh, I was, I was just so thirsty, but I knew where that water was. It was just a, a little ways to travel to it. And that was kind of a pain, but, um, thanks. Thankfully I had that catadine with me, uh, probably would have had, would have been nice to, to plan that a little bit better and maybe fill that catadine up and carry that with me to where I was going. Uh, but also with that water and the elk side of things, they do come down to that. A, a lot of times, you can you can sit like water holes in the middle of the day and those big bulls will leave the the cows and go for a drink not very common i don't think in this area because they got to come in the wide open to get to that water so they're doing it right at dusk or they're doing it in the middle of the night and i think those bigger bulls are probably mostly doing it in the middle of the night um still opportunities to in that in that dust time that they're coming down but they don't if you can find those spots uh and one of those spots was this is this is kind of cool to see uh and i talked to these other hunters that were in there and i actually was texting tonight the iowa guys and i sent them a picture of the bull and we were talking back and forth and uh right when i passed that bull i ran into those iowa guys when i was all dehydrated and that night they passed on two different little bulls that that came down uh to that water. And so this interesting thing I found out is right where those springs are, the head of that water, uh you all those draws leading up to it, it just makes sense that those draws, if there's elk in those, they're gonna come right down to that one, to the head of that. Otherwise, it's a long stream going down the draw, and there's there's little finger draws coming down perpendicular to that little stream so where are those out going to come down to that water i don't know uh they could come down at any one of those points and get a drink so it's hard to pinpoint where they're coming down to it but the one area that you knew for sure is the head head spring of that that's where 
they would be coming down to. And in some of that country, I think that you're hunting where there's water everywhere. That's not a thing that you're going to find because it sounds like water's just everywhere. Um, but the, uh, in this area, it's pretty dry and, and they're going to hit that first spring. Okay. What are the biggest takeaways that you have that you're going to take into next year's hunt? Uh, my communication with the elk. So knowing not to overcall and, uh, just locate the bull and get in close. Getting within 200 yards of, of a bugling elk is not that hard and keeping it really simple. Jermaine Hodge told us that over and over. It's really easy. <laughs> it just, you do this, you do it, you rinse and repeat. That's, that's Jermaine's kind of main, main line that he used. Uh, if you can find a bull, you, you listen to him, just get in close. After you're in close, then it's a, okay, can I, can this happen? And the other takeaway is going to be, uh, there is no, there's no, uh, uh, alternative to just working hard. Uh, I would say I was on the top of my game for my elk tactics and my shooting. I was not in my top most physical condition. So there was a limiting factor there. Uh, I won't give any excuses for that at all, but my shooting and my bow setup was some of the best it's ever been. Uh, that just was there because of practice uh, the amount of conversations we have had this this summer with various experts that do this all September long and learning from them and then putting that into practice. Uh, I swear the last three podcasts of Remy's in September or August, all on elk hunting, he was saying things like, I saw that. That is exactly what that bull did. It's exactly what that bull did. Uh, and, and not just say that I was... Uh, a YouTuber elk hunter, like l learned from YouTube university. Uh, but taking that and taking my experiences from the past and putting them all together. So I felt very confident in, and in, in feeling like I actually knew what I was saying to those elk. I knew what I needed to say. And that just came with some of that practice and learn and filling it in with a couple of those, those, uh, experts and, and okay. I am saying the right thing. That makes sense. Okay. Yes. That makes sense. Joel. Thanks for sharing that piece of information. Uh, I'm going to cow call. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. So those are some of the big, big ones. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'd say, I'd say that's, that's, that's the primary takeaways that I'd, I'd be taking. Almost ingraining that now as instinct. Now, yeah. what uh, would you say your biggest failures are that, you're never going to do again in the woods. Uh, I would say I had that stock on that five point bull. I'm never going to show him a decoy too early. Uh, okay. I am always going to, I'm going to keep, I'm not going to say I'm not going to do this again, but, uh, I always try and, go the right way, not the easy way. And I went the easy way one time. I didn't listen to myself and I went the easy way. And that was ended up not being the right way in, in stocking a bull. So that was, that was one thing I got to just keep in my mind, keep going and uh, ingraining that in the, in a stock. Even if that's a little bit further, a little bit harder, you need to go that way. If the, the wind's going to be better. So Otherwise, I feel like okay. most of my my encounters with elk on this trip, some of the I made some of the best decisions, which was kind of cool, and that's what made it feel really successful. That is like I could have shot that bull, I could have got in a little closer, I pissed him off, and he was he was coming to find me. I just made one little error. Every little, every one of those encounters with elk was just a, uh, one little decision away from making the, a major mistake. And 
this is why I like to hunt by myself. Um, I really, eh, one reason I like to hunt by myself is that these decisions that ha- that happened all in that eight minutes and 22 seconds was not well thought out. It was just, like you're saying, instinct. I heard this, did this, heard this, did this. I saw this, I did this. If I was with somebody else, I would have felt like I needed to talk it out or like look at them for assurance. And that's one reason I like to to do that with somebody or with by myself. I would like to go into the elk woods with one other person though. At some point, I don't want to solo hunt all by myself all the time because if I had somebody else to help make those calls, I would have called in double the number of elk. Just if I had somebody behind me or if I was behind them, uh, staying back a little ways, double the success. I think we could have killed even more elk. I think we could have filled all the tags. Um, just, just would have been, that would have been really nice. But also some of my best hunts, it's just been me by myself. And I'm, it, it would be nice to share that excitement. Uh, it would have been really cool to share this moment with my dad. It would have been cool to share the, um, my mountain goat hunt with my dad or a friend. It would have been exciting to share. Uh, I have a big giant black bear, uh, from Colorado that, I called in. I wish somebody else would have been there to see that. That's, that's a hard thing when it's, I'm the only one that sees that. And it's the only thing in green I can visualize. Um, that's why having the video of this was so cool because I could, I, I was holding tie up in the front. I blew it. I mirrored it on the TV and I was pointing it out and showing him. And, and he thought that was pretty cool. Uh, I finally got to show him the whole video and, and he was impressed and, and, uh, he's, uh, he's excited for his hunt. We're going on our, uh, he's going on his first doe hunt on Sunday next week. So we're pretty excited. Oh. I just made him excited. And he asked when he can go. And I said, you know what? You can go elk hunting when you can put weight on your back and you can walk a long ways. That's yep. the major limiting factor is, and that's probably going to, 12 is probably even kind of pushing it. We're going to have to find an easier hunt for, for him, but it's, it's a lot of hard work. This is, this is not for the faint of heart. There's, there's a lot of hiking. Um, even, even with that elk on the ground, looking at that, getting all that meat off of there. That's, that's a lot of work. And we had this conversation before off air, you know, you got to be picking them up over every single piece of deadfall. They have to be able to, it, it's tough on those little legs to keep up with dad. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I, I, in the, in the elk woods on this kind of hunt, I would, I would wait. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to wait. I've, I've been pushing my kids on all kinds of hunts as, as much as possible. And heck the, the book we read tonight was, there's this really cool little series that I, this guy had a booth at the national trapping convention in Sioux Falls this year that he had these books that were just hunting adventures with him and his kid. And uh, the illustration on the kid, oh, it's, it's rough. This kid looks weird, but the, <laughs> yeah, the stories are like, it's accurate. It's written by a hunter and Ty's asking about going moose hunting and bear hunting in Alaska and all this stuff. I was like, yeah, buddy, well, maybe caribou someday, but that's by then it's going to be way, we're going to be outpriced. I don't know. <laughs> it'll, it'll be a, a tough thing to do, but, um, he's asking about all that. And I think, I think there's, there's hunts to pick and choose on. And one of them is antelope. I think antelope is a, is a great hunt for a kid, uh, white tail, um, in a tree stand is a great hunt for a kid. Uh, it, just nothing too late into the season for him. Keeping them comfy is a big part of it. You know, making sure they have fun. Yeah. Don't get their hopes up. Don't get their expectations up. Hey, bud, we, odds are we probably won't see anything. And then when you do see the big one or, you know, your target animal makes it that much better. 
Yeah. What is one piece of gear that you definitely could have used that you didn't have? And what do you have for extra gear that you could have cut? I had that pretty dialed. Um, the I, I wouldn't even say it's gear. I would say it's food related. I was... I, I had too much food. Uh, I, I, I knew this, but I just did it anyway. A uh, couple of days I threw in a peak breakfast. It's wor- waste of weight. Uh, I would normally eat all of this food on a, on a regular day and some, but I couldn't eat it. I just couldn't eat it. I ended up losing five pounds on this this hunt. Uh, brought me back to my, down to my wrestling weight, one ninety. <laughs> yeah, I was like, actually one ninety five. Uh, oh I mean, my goodness! Weighed myself today at like one ninety six six, and that was a couple of days after and eating pretty good. So I lo- I think I lost at least five pounds, um, which is kind of weird, but because I don't I lose weight easy if you do some of that quick activity but i also haven't gained or fluctuated any weight since college uh i've got a weird body uh but i i think i just had too much food um the i was good on my amount of energy and focus hydrate and recover uh the new black rifle coffee instant coffees did not disappoint um i would yeah cut down on some food Otherwise, I had that gear so well dialed, I felt like I had just about everything. Um, I I did bring in a tripod because weight wasn't as big of an issue on this trip. And a gl- for glassing tripod. And if this were for deer, absolutely a must. Uh, for elk, really wasn't necessary. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, maybe another water bottle or something just because it was so maybe I guess my bladder, my water bladder, I probably would have drank more water if, if that was in my pack and that would have, that would have taken care of another had two water bottles and that water bladder, which is a lot of water for me. But uh, I think in this situation, that would have been pretty good. Okay. Well, do you think we got, uh, uh, the listeners are money's worth. Yeah, all zero sense of it. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, no, you get what you pay for. Yeah, and, and we can wrap this up. We're well into an hour and a half. But uh, yeah, this this was a hunt of a lifetime, and and one that I was able to to put together a lot of a lot of pieces of the puzzle, and and come away with a what ended up being a three hundred seventeen inch bull, which only uh matters to me in the sense of uh just how cool he is and celebrating it one more thing i was going to ask you real quick are you doing a shoulder mount are you doing european what uh what are your plans uh just european uh as it was laying there i realized i don't know if i could do this where it was laying how it was laying would have been really, really hard to do, uh, as well as in that 24 hour period, I don't know if the hide would have made it. The meat it's good to go. It doesn't have a hint of anything. It stayed nice and cool that entire time. I checked it and checked it and checked it. So my meat's good to go, but a hide would have been, well, maybe it would have been fine. I don't, I don't really know. Uh, and I don't have a, the wall space for it. There was something about this. I just said, I don't need a shoulder mount. I've, I've done a lot of mounting lace recently, uh, but a European mounted elk is going to look really good right here behind me. And that it has to go on this little remodel when I get to this project right here on a, uh, and we start doing a few more videos with barn wood and that bowl right behind me. That's going to be important. And I need to get a little bit bigger sign that says Western hunting hub, the other bigger than that one right there behind me. So we'll get, we'll get some cool stuff and, uh, 
um, good winter project. So, yep, just a European mount, and I think it'll look pretty sweet. Heck yeah. Yeah. That'll be awesome. All right. Well, thank you, Mark, for making me tell a story. Well, it's fresh. You're off to the Elkwoods right now. Uh, be very careful. You're going to be driving for the next, it's 1030 at night right now, and you're going to be driving a long time. Uh, hopefully that gives you a little fire under you to, to get out and get it done. Cause, uh, you were, you were kind of running on empty there for even before your trip here. So get after it, have a good time and, and be safe. Appreciate it, Clint. And, uh, sure will. And hopefully I come back with a story to tell. Yeah, absolutely. Got a deed to the land, but it ain't my ground. This is God's country.